Now let's talk about the third method of the cost flow methods, which is the weighted average cost method. So when the weighted average cost method is used in a perpetual inventory system, a weighted average unit cost for each item is computed each time a purchase is made. And I want you to pay attention to that because the average would only change once we have a new purchase. Whenever we make a sale, the average is going to stay the same. But once we need, we make a new purchase transaction, we have to update our, our average. So the unit cost is used to determine the cost of each sale until another purchase is made and a new average is computed. The technique is called a moving average. So let's see how it works. So in this table here, you can see that we have the same format where we have the very left column for the date. We have a, a main column for the purchase, a main column for the cost of goods sold, and a main col column for the inventory. And each one of these columns is divided into quantity, unit cost, and total cost. And then remember, we started on January 1st with a thousand uh, units at $20 cost for a total of $20,000. Then we sold 700. So, in this case, the 700, there are based on the 20, and we have enough quantity to cover that, and that would leave us worth 300. So 700 multiplied by 20 is 14,000, and then the leftovers would be 300, which is the 1,000 minus the 700, so the remaining uh, inventory quantity would be 300, multiplied by 20, and that would be uh, $6,000. Then on the 10th, we purchased 500 units at $22.40 for a total of 11,200. So now this is going to change our average. So how we calculate the new average? Remember, we had 300 and now we got another 500. So the new total is 800. Okay, so that's a new quantity for our inventory. Then we have 20 and we have 2240. So which one should we use or should how can we get the average? We don't just simply add the 20 and the 22.4 and divide them by two. That's not the average. That's not how we calculate the average. Remember, it's a weighted average. So what we do is that we take the seven, the, the 6,000 plus the 11,200, and that will give us a total of 17,200. We divide the 17,200 17, by the 800, and that will give us 2150. So that's how we calculate the new average cost of the inventory. So again, we add the total cost for the older batch and the total cost for the newer batch, add them together, that's 17,200, divide them by 800, which is the new quantity, and that will give us 2150. Now we have two transactions that happened on the 22nd and the 28th. On the 22nd, we sold 360, so we're going to use this average, 2150, and that would be a total of 7740. And if we deduct the 360 out of the 800, that would give us 440, multiplied by again by the 2150, and that would be 9460. Then on the 28th, we sold, we sold another 240 units, again using the same average, 2150, and that would be 5160. So if we deduct 240 from the 440, the remaining balance is 200. So again, we take the 200, multiply it by the average that we've been using, and that would be 4300. Now we have another purchase transaction on the 30th, which is 600 units at 2330. So you can see the prices are going up. And now the total cost, if we multiply 600 by 2330, that's 1398. So remember, every time we have a purchase, we need to update our average. So we take the 4300 plus the 13,980, and that would be 18,280. That would be the total cost for all batches we have. Then the number of units available would be the 200 plus the 600 purchase, which is 800. Then we divide 18 to 80 by the 800, and that would be 2285. To calculate the cost of goods sold, we just add the entire column. So 14 plus 7740 plus 5160, and that would be 26900. To calculate the inventory balance will be just the last balance we have here. One thing I want to remind you, when we're using the weighted average, we're never going to split any row. So unlike uh, if I go back to the to life, for example, you see here, in some cases we had to split the row into two sub rows. Why did we do that? Because we had two batches in one row. But uh, in, in the weighted average, we don't have that. We have to use the, like 
for every date it's it's just one row so this is the whole idea or this is the main difference between the FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average under the perpetual system. In the periodic inventory system, which we didn't cover in chapter uh, in chapter five, we are going to cover it here in chapter six, just for the for the for the sake of seeing how it affects FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average. And I think part of the reason that we covered it is because it's much easier. Uh, you, you'll see like how easy it is to, to do the calculation. So when the periodic inventory system is used, only revenue is recorded each time a sale is made. No entry is made at the, sale, at the time of the sale to record the cost of goods sold. So in the periodic system, we only calculate the cost of goods sold once, which is at the end of the accounting period. So at the end of the accounting period, a physical inventory is taken uh, to determine the cost of the inventory and the cost of goods sold. Like the perpetual inventory system, a cost, a cost flow assumption must be made when identical units are acquired at different unit costs during the period. So let's see another example, and we'll see how we can apply the periodic system. And I'm just telling you, it's, it's much easier. So here we're applying the first in, first out method, assuming that we have a periodic inventory system. At the beginning of inventory and purchase of items, uh, of item 127B, which is just a code for an item, is Jan uh, in January are as follows. We have the beginning balance of 1,000 units at $20 each. Then we have purchase of 500 units at $2,240, and then purchase of 600 units at $2,330. And that made the available uh, for sale units during the month $2,100, which is the total of these numbers. And then the total of inventory, the total purchases and inventory is $45,180. We, we call that the cost of goods available for sale. So the physical count on January 31st shows that 800 units on hand. So let me just go back one slide. So we had 2,100 units available for sale. When we did the physical count, we found that our leftover inventory is 800. So this means that how many units were sold. So it's basically the difference between 2,100 and 800, which is 1,300 units. So the physical count on January 31st shows that 800 units are on hand. The cost of the 800 units in ending inventory on January 31st is determined as follows. So let's do the math and see what is the cost of these 800 leftover units based on first in, first out. Remember, in first in, first out, the, the ending inventory would be based on the latest items purchased. So we have to go back and see what were the latest units we purchased? We have 600 units at 2330, and we have 500 units at 2240. We, we don't need 500. Try to think how many, how many more units do we need on top of the 600? So we have 600. We know that our ending inventory balance is 800, so we need 200 more. So we're going to take 200 out of the 500 at 2240. So as you can see here, the most recent cost on January 30th purchase is 600 units at 2330 and then the, mo the, the, the the next most recent cost which was January 10th the purchase uh, is 200 units out of the 500 at the cost of 2240. Then we add these two numbers together and then the, our inventory balance would be 18460. Remember this was the cost of goods available for sale before we sold items and this is our inventory. In the ending inventory now. So the difference between these two numbers would be our cost of goods sold. So that's what we are going to see in this slide. So deducting the cost of the January 31st inventory from the cost of goods available for sale yields the cost of goods sold. So our beginning inventory on January was 20,000. We had purchases of 25,180. The cost of goods available for sale were 45,180. We deducted the inventory, which we just calculated. The previous slide here, which is 18,460. So our cost of goods sold would be 26,720. So as you can see, in, in, in the periodic system, we really don't need to do this kind of table to, or chart to, uh, to keep like a running balance for our inventory based on first in, first out, or last in, first out, or even weighted average. It's much simpler because we calculate the cost of goods sold only once at the end of the accounting period. 
So the 18,460 cost of ending inventory on January 31st is made up, made up of the most recent costs. The 26,720 cost of goods sold is made up of the beginning inventory and the earliest cost. If you want to confirm that, I'll just go back to this slide here that shows like the, the cost of or the items that we sold. So we sold 1,300 units. So we sold the entire 1,000 at 20 and 300 out of the 500 at 2240. If you do the math, it would give us the exact same value, which is 26,720. So one more thing that can explain this to, to us a little bit more, which is this chart here. You can see that we have 1,000 units at 20, 500 units at 2240, and then 600 units at 2330. When we do the multiplication, and or the calculation we have 20,000, 11,200, and the 13,980. Our total is 45,180. We call that column the goods available for sale. The cost of goods sold were 1,300 units. So we took a thousand from the $20 items and we took 300 out of the 500, and the remaining 200 went to end inventory. And of course, the 600 entirely went to the end inventory. So our cost of goods sold was 1,000 multiplied by 20 and the 300 multiplied by 2240. And you can see it's 20,000 plus the 6720 for a total of 26,720. For ending inventory, we took the remaining 200 units out of 500 at 2240 and the entire batch of 600 at 2330. And that gave us 4480 plus the 13,980 for a total of 18,460. One thing I want you to be aware of, always, always, Cost of goods sold plus ending inventory should be equal to cost of goods available for sale. So cost of goods available for sale is equal to the total of cost of goods sold and the ending inventory. Now let's try to apply that to last in first out. Same concept. So assume again that the physical count in January 31st shows that 800 units are in hand. The cost of the 800 units in the ending inventory on January 31st is 16,000 which consists of 600 units from the beginning inventory that cost of $20 per unit. So it's going to be flipped now. Our ending inventory under LIFO would be our oldest items. So we're going to start from the top. So deducting the cost of the, the cost of the January 31st inventory from the cost of goods available for sale yields the cost of goods sold and we'll see how it's computed. So again, we do the same thing. We have our original inventory, we have the purchases, and that will give us the cost of goods available for sale, which is the 45,180. Then we subtract the end inventory, which is the 16,000 that we just calculated in the previous slide here, which is the 800 multiplied by $20 per unit. Remember, we had a thousand units in our beginning balance, so uh, we had enough to cover it in one batch. So we, we subtract the 16,000 from the 45,180, and that will give us a cost of goods sold of 29.80. So the $16,000 cost of the ending inventory on January 31st is made up of the earlier or the earliest cost. The 29.180 cost of goods sold is made up of the most recent cost. Again, let's see or try to visualize this. So again, here we have our three batches, our beginning inventory of 1,000 units, the first purchase of 500 units, and the latest purchase of 600 units. So we multiply each one by um, each number of units by its cost. We get the goods available for sale, which is going to be exactly the same value, 45,180. Very similar to what we've done in um, the FIFO method. But remember, now our end inventory, we started with that. It's coming from the top, not from the bottom, like the previous calculation here. We started from the bottom for the end inventory. Here in, in last in, first out, um, the inventory would be based on the oldest items. So we took 800 units at 20, and then our cost of goods sold would be coming from three different batches. Because remember, we sold 1,300 units. So 200 units came from the 20 batch, 500 units came from the 2240, and 600 units at the 2330. If you add 200, 500, and 600, that, that is 1,300 units. And now we get a new cost of goods available for sale value, which is 29,180. So 29,180 plus the 16,000 will give us the 45,180, which is the cost of goods available for sale. 
But finally, let's see the weighted average method. And again, it's very simple because we're not doing a running weighted average, it's just once. So the, it's calculated as follows, where we get the total cost uh, of units available for sale divided by units available for sale. So what is the average cost per unit in the ending inventory? So weighted average unit cost would be equal to 45,180, which is the cost of units available for sale, or cost of goods available for sale, divided by 2,100 units, which were the number of units available for sale. And now we got a new uh, weighted average unit cost, which is 2,151. So that is a rounded number, but we're still going to use it. So that's the average cost per unit. If we take that, multiply it by 800, that would give us 17,208, and that would be our ending balance of inventory. If we take the same rate and multiply it by the, the, the 1,300, we can get the cost of goods sold. However, they decided to present it that way. We still have our beginning balance plus the purchases. It gives us the cost of goods available for sale. Then we subtract the ending inventory that we just calculated, which is 17,208, and the cost of goods sold would be 27,972. So again, here we, we've seen the, the three different methods again, FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average, applying the periodic system. So let me stop here. In the next video, we'll start comparing about these methods and see which one would lead to a higher cost of goods sold and lower cost of goods sold.